We're going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. And I'm speaking from the King James translation. Paul's writing. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Verse 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him. Now this must have been an amazing thing for the Apostle Paul to write. Because the church of Corinth had been an extremely pagan congregation, a city. And now such grace has been poured out on them. He says, in every way you are enriched by him. And when Paul says in every way, it is the Greek word panty, which is not necessary in Greek. The word pan means everything. It's where we get the word for a panorama. It's where we got Pan Am Airlines. So if you have the word pan by itself, it already is all-encompassing. But when you add the little word T to it, it becomes pan T. Now it's not just the big picture. Now it's also T, the most minute, minuscule detail. So Paul says in the biggest ways and in the most minute, minuscule ways, you have been enriched by him. This word enriched is the Greek word plusias. And the word plusias describes someone that is filthy, stinking rich. And in fact, that is really the only way that you can translate this word. This word plusias is where we get the word for a plutocrat, which is someone who has so much wealth, they are not able to figure out how much wealth they have because every day it's amassing more and more and more wealth. He is filthy, stinking rich. It is the same word used in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 when the Bible tells us that God is rich in mercy, the Greek word plusias, which means when it comes to the mercy of God, God is so rich in mercy, God himself is not certain how much mercy he has. There's no way to tabulate it because God is filthy, stinking rich when it comes to his mercy. Can you say amen to that? But now he's speaking to the Corinthians and he uses the same word plusias. He says that in everything, in the big picture, even in the most minute, minuscule way, you are filthy, stinking rich in him. And then he tells us how they were rich. In all utterance and in all knowledge. Well, utterance refers to the utterance gifts of the Holy Spirit. Here you would have prophecy, tongues, interpretation. So according to Paul, we know the church of Corinth was rich, overflowing with the utterance gifts of the Spirit. But not only the utterance gifts of the Spirit, he also says, and knowledge. Knowledge would be the knowledge gifts of the Spirit, discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. And interesting, the utterance gifts and the knowledge gifts have always been the most desired gifts. These are the gifts that can grab can gather a crowd. If someone hears that a man is moving accurately in the word of wisdom, you can pack an auditorium or the word of knowledge or prophecy because people hang on the edge of their seats for these kind of manifestations. But Paul says to the Corinthian church in regard to these kinds of manifestations, you are rich, you are overflowing in all utterance and in all knowledge. Then he says in verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was, the King James Version says, confirmed among you. That word for confirmed is the Greek word bibios, which means to make established, to make a thing plain. Now what does that mean? It means that in the church of Corinth, there was nothing about Jesus that was a fantasy. Everything about Jesus was a reality because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. Many, many years ago, when Denise and I first moved to the Soviet Union, I visited the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And as I was walking through the Hermitage, and you have to remember at that time it was still the Soviet Union, I began to look at the most beautiful religious paintings of Christ. And on the bottom of each painting was the name of the painting. One painting would say, the fairy tale of Jesus raising the dead. I would go to the next painting. The fairy tale 
of Christ walking on the water. And at first, I found that a little offensive. But then I began to realize that when I was growing up in church, everything I read about Christ was also a fairy tale. Because we only read it in the Bible. We never saw any of that happen in our church. We never saw anyone healed. We never saw a demon cast out. It was no different than reading fairy tales. This was simply the stuff of literature. But when the power of God begins to operate inside a church and suddenly the gift of prophecy is operating, Christ is no longer the fairy tale prophet because the prophet is walking through the church. And that aspect of Christ is then confirmed. It is established among you. For instance, today when I read the four gospels, it is not difficult for me to imagine what it was like when Christ cast out demons. Why? Because I have seen demons cast out. It has caused that activity, that manifestation has established that truth of Christ in my heart. And this is one reason why we desperately need to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our churches. It brings us a reality of Christ. And then Paul says in the next verse, who shall also confirm you unto the end. That word end is the Greek word telos. It is the Greek word for maturity or completion. Well, I had always been taught in the Baptist church that the Corinthian church was carnal because they spoke in tongues. They were carnal because of spiritual manifestations. But by using this word telos, Paul says, no, 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 no. The gifts of the Spirit will confirm you unto the end. They will establish you, the Greek word telos, and bring you into a place of maturity and completion, implying there's a certain level of maturity we simply cannot attain without the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul was in love with this church because it was the first time he had really had a successful ministry. If you remember when Paul was first called into the ministry, Ananias prophesied over him, and Ananias gave him the prophetic order for his ministry. First of all, he said, you are called to the Gentiles. Secondly, he said, you are called to the Jews. And thirdly, you are called to kings and to those that are in authority. But Paul was a Jew. And everything in him wanted to reach the Jew. Even when he wrote Romans chapter 1, he said, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. But when you find Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, you find that when he comes to a new city, though his primary call is to the Gentiles, his natural inclination is to go to the Jews. So he keeps running to the Jews over and over and over and over. They beat him. They leave him for dead. They do not want to hear him. They chase him from city to city while the Gentiles want to hear more. Please tell us more. He didn't want to talk to the Gentiles. That was not his natural inclination. Don't let anybody ever tell you that God will call you that God won't call you where you're uncomfortable. It's not true. Paul was not comfortable with Gentiles, but yet that was the primary call on his life. And Paul never really got in a focused Gentile ministry until he came to Corinth in Acts chapter 18. And when he came to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, as he always did, first he went to the synagogue. And he tried to reach the Jews. The Jews were not interested. And finally, after beating his head against the wall and beating his head against the wall, he is so frustrated trying to convince these Jews, he finally says, that's enough. Your blood be on your own head. I am going to the Gentiles. And he literally walked out the door of the synagogue into the door of the next house. It said that he walked into the house whose wall was joined hard to the synagogue. So even though he left the Jews, he didn't go very far. He went far enough to be away from the Jews, but close enough that on their way to the synagogue, they could stop in where he was preaching to hear what he had to say. And when Paul began to focus on his Gentile ministry, that is when the Lord showed up. And the Lord said, Paul, don't be afraid. No man will be able to lay a hand on you. 
And Paul stayed in the city of Corinth for one and a half year. It was the longest period of ministry he had ever had. Started the largest church he had ever established. And he loves this church. It is the greatest fruit of his ministry apart from Ephesus. And when he writes to them, he says, you're spilling over with the grace of God. But then when you come to verse 10, we find there's something very wrong inside the church. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And the first of verse 10 where he says, I beseech you, that word beseech is the Greek word para kalo. Para means alongside of, kalo means to call out to. When you put these two words together, it is the picture of someone who is falling on his knees. It is a word of prayer. Now the great apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church has literally fallen to his knees and figuratively he is begging, he is pleading, he is imploring with them to hear what he has to say. He says, I beseech you, I implore you, my brethren. And then he says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he now moves into the highest level of apostolic authority. I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no what? Divisions among you. This word divisions is the Greek word merizo, which means to take a garment and rip it from one side to the other so that all the edges are frayed. In other words, this is not a clean cut like you could do with a pair of scissors. Something has happened in the church that has literally ripped it in half. It is a raw situation. Things are very frayed inside the church. He says that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be what? The King James Version says, perfectly joined together, a specific Greek word only used in one way. This phrase, perfectly joined together, is only used after a civil war and means to restore order, rebuild the roads, rebuild civility among yourselves. And by using this word, now we find whatever has happened in this wonderful church is so tragic that brother has been fighting brother. It is like a civil war going on inside the church of Corinth. And Paul says, please stop this, stop this, stop this. Restore order, fix the roads, lay down your weapons. Let's restore order to this situation. And that you all speak the same thing and have the same mind and the same judgment. Then look at verse 11. For it has been declared to me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, either underline or circle this word contentions. Well, at the time that Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, he was in the city of Ephesus, which was all the way across the Aegean Sea. Whatever is happening in the church of Corinth is so terrible that there is one family in the church, the household of Chloe, and they have decided to tattletale. They are risking their friendships, they are risking their relationships, they have made the decision, we are going to go to Paul, which meant they had to go from Corinth to Chincrea, from Chincrea they had to catch a ship, go all the way across the Aegean, go up the Keister River, till they find the Apostle Paul in the city of Ephesus, at great expense, they came to tell Paul what was happening. And Paul says, it's been declared unto me. Declared means to talk with your hands. They were very vivid. They were very dramatic. Well, you have to remember they were Greeks. So now they're talking to Paul and they're waving with their hands and they're saying this person has done this and that person has done this. And specifically the household of Chloe has told him that there are, what was it? contentions among you. This word contentions is the Greek word eres. The word eres is always translated political parties. Political parties. So if you have a newer translation, it may even say, they have told me there are party spirits among you. 
So you have to stop and think for a minute, what is a political party? And of course, this is the state of Florida, and you've got big things going on in Florida right now with different candidates. Whether you're a candidate or whether you're a political party, the word eres, it describes someone who has his own mindset, he has his own convictions, he has his own platform and his own agenda and tries to gather as many people around him who will agree with his platform and his agenda. And that is perfectly acceptable in a nation, but this is not acceptable inside the house of God. But in some way, the church of Corinth has become divided. There are people with their own platforms, people with their own agendas. And by the way, every church has this. Every church has it, just in a different form. For instance, when you're the pastor of the church, you become familiar with every political party in the church. I'm the pastor of the church. There is the children's ministry, and they believe revival's gonna come to the world through the children's ministry, and therefore they deserve the biggest part of the budget, and they have their group that forms around them, and then you have the music ministry who believes nothing will happen without the presence of God and without a lot of musicians, and so they have their party and their platform, and then of course you have the youth ministry who always wants more money, 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 and they believe that they are right, and the church can be divided by wonderful things. But the pastor has to see everything. He has a different view than anybody else. But now what kind of political parties were inside this church? We find this in the next verse. The next verse says, Now this I say, that every one of you, the Greek word hekestas, an all-embracing term, which means literally every single one of you. This infection has gone throughout the whole church of Corinth, and now the entire church is involved in this contention. Now, every one of you saith, number one, I am of Paul. So party number one is the Paul party. Then there's a group who says... And I'm of Apollos. Group number two, the Apollos party. And I of Cephas. Group number three, the Cephas party or the Peter party. And finally, we have group number four, that group in the church who says, I'm not of Paul, I'm not of Apollos, I'm not of Peter, I am of Christ. This is the Christ party. Well, if you look at this verse, you can logically see how the church had fragmented between these personalities. It's very simple to see. Paul started the church. He was their first pastor. It was Paul who brought the gospel. It was Paul who worked signs and wonders. It was Paul who laid the foundation of the church. And they just loved, 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 loved him and felt such a devotion to him because he was their first pastor. Now, how many of you can remember your first pastor? Oh, I loved my first pastor. He was the best pastor in the world. I would visit other churches and I would feel sorry for other churches because their pastor was so pathetic compared to my pastor. And you ought to feel that way about your pastor. But Paul had a style, everybody say style, that was very unique. Paul was not an eloquent speaker. In fact, Paul was so rough he said things in his epistles which Pastor Paul would not permit me to say from this pulpit today. For instance, when he wrote to the Philippians and he said the Judaizers were all dogs. Well, what would you think if I stood up here today as a guest in your pulpit and said, I'm going to tell you about some preachers in this town that I think are a bunch of dogs. You probably would think that was a little inappropriate. Or how about when he wrote to the Galatians? And he said something, he said something, so audacious that you will never find a translation that properly translates it. He said to the Galatians, so you believe that circumcision will make you holy? This is in chapter 5. Why don't you just go ahead and 
emasculate yourself, which is the equivalent of saying, if you think circumcision will bring you a little righteousness, why don't you just go ahead and cut the whole thing and become real righteous? That is exactly what the Greek says. And that's why you will never find a translation that correctly translates that verse. How can you put that in the Bible? But that was the only pastor they ever knew. So when he talked like that, his congregation said, wow, that is good preaching. It was the only preaching they knew. That was the only style they knew. But eventually the time came when Paul moved on. He left Corinth and he went to Ephesus. And the brothers in Ephesus dispatched a new pastor to the city of Corinth. And guess what his name was? Apollos. And though Paul and Apollos taught the same identical doctrine, their style, everybody say style, was completely different. Apollos was sophisticated. He was a Jew from Alexandria. He had studied in the great library of Alexandria. In fact, history tells us writers from the second and the third century, he was a golden-tongued orator. He was the kind of man that you would have to bring a dictionary to church to understand what he said. He was gracious and he was eloquent. And now, there was a certain group in the church who said, oh, finally, I can invite my family and friends to church. <laughs> we have a pastor who knows how to publicly speak. But there was another group who said, we don't like him. He's too smart. He uses too much Greek. We want some real preaching like Paul. And the church began to divide, not over doctrine, but over style or personality. Then at some point, Peter came into the church. We don't know when he came, but we know Peter always attracted a legalistic crowd. And someone in the church thought, wow, that is awesome bondage. We just love that kind of preaching. And so now there is the Peter party. And last of all, there was the... Christ party, these were the super spirituals who were so spiritual, they weren't committed to any pastor, they weren't committed to any church, they were just members of the universal church. Now here's what's to me fascinating. If you look at this list, the Paul party has been gone for 2,000 years, the Apollos party has been gone for 2,000 years, the Peter party's been gone for 2,000 years, but that Christ group, they are still here today. <laughs> they wander from church to church. They submit to nobody. They're on their own. And they think they are the most spiritual of all. They are their own party. And so now the church of Corinth has divided into these groups. The Paul group, Apollos group, the Peter group, the Christ group. And when you get to the end of Corinthians, you find that Apollos had been so hurt by this that when Paul asked Apollos to go back to Corinth, the Bible says Apollos was not willing to go back there. Now let me tell you something difficult. When a church has had a strong pastor for many years, that's marvelous. Paul, how, how long have you been pastor here? 28 years. You guys ought to all say amen. That is very unusual. I've been the pastor of my church this year 12 years in Moscow, and I'm a very strong pastor. If I suddenly disappeared and my son stepped into the pulpit, which is what I believe is going to happen, and without any preparation, without any succession, without any investment of preparing the church, I disappeared and he became the pastor. 
it would be a shock to my church. It doesn't matter how much they love my son, he's not me. And every time he stood up to preach, the natural inclination would be to judge him by the former pastor. Well, he doesn't do this like the former pastor. He doesn't preach like the former pastor. And truly, in my case, that's a problem because which of my sons are going to be able to exegete from the Greek the way that I do? They're not going to be able to do that. And so the easiest thing for a church is to take a church through a transition succession, which is really the way they did it in the New Testament. But in this particular case, the church had been shocked with a new pastor. Some liked him, some didn't like him. Now the church is fighting and Paul says, please, please, please stop the civil war, lay down the weapons, let's restore order to this church. Go to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, and verse 5, Paul asks them a rhetorical question. He said, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Do you understand this was his opportunity? If he was really an insecure person, he at this moment could have said, what do you mean you like Apollos more than me? Have you forgotten who brought you the gospel? But Paul was very secure in who he was. And Paul says, what is all this noise? Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Then in the following verse, Paul says, I have what? Planted. Apollos has watered. Paul clearly understands where his ministry begins and where his ministry ends. He says, I am a planter. I am a starter. I am anointed to plant. I am anointed to start. Apollos is anointed as a waterer, as a nurturer. And in fact, if you look at Paul's ministry, you will find that Paul was a marvelous starter. Paul was not a good finisher. That's why he surrounded himself with people that had gifts of nurturing. That's why he took Timothy and he took Luke and he took Titus. These were men that had real pastoral hearts. But Paul had an anointing to come into a city and move hell out of the way and to lay the foundation. But he didn't have a lot more patience to take it further than that. Paul had a hard time dealing with people long term. And I believe that's why he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I believe he looked in the mirror every day and said, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. <laughs> he did not do long-term good with people. So he surrounded himself with finishers. And Paul says, I'm a starter. I'm a planter. Apollos is a waterer. Apollos can't do what I do, and I cannot do what Apollos does. There is no competition here. And then he says, God gives the increase. If there's any party we ought to have, it ought to be the God party, because it doesn't matter how much planting and how much watering you do, God is the only one that can provide the atmosphere. God is the only one that can provide growth. So she says, we're going to focus on somebody. Let's focus on the real source. It's God who gives increase. Then he says in the following verse, now look at this. Now he that planteth, so then neither is he that planteth anything, either he that watereth, or he equalizes everybody. But God that gives the increase. Now he that planteth and watereth are one, not opposed to each other, the Greek word henna, it means on the same team working together, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Who do you suppose that word we refers to? He's talking about him and Apollos. We, me and Apollos, keep it in context. We're not in competition with each other. The two of us, we are laborers together with God. This is a threesome. We are working together. And then he says, you are God's husbandry. Well, that's in context. He's been saying, I'm the planter, Apollos is the water, you are God's husbandry. And then he says, no, 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 I have a better example. Let's change examples. You are God's building. And then in verse 10 he says, 
according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another man builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. But look at the first of verse 10 where he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. This word according to is the Greek word kata, K-A-T-A. The word kata describes something which comes downward. It is subjugating. It is conquering. You could literally translate it being dominated, being conquered by the grace of God, which is given unto me. Which tells me that Paul had a fight with his own call. Why would he have a fight with his own call? Because he was a planter. He was a starter. He started the church of Corinth, got it established, moved on. And now in the new city, he's planting. He's doing it again, and he hears about how the church he just left is fabulously growing. And then when he's finished with this one, that's his anointing. He's a planter. He's a pioneer. He's a starter. He does it. He's anointed to do it. And once he's finished, he moves on. And when he moves on to do it again, he hears about all the glorious things happening where he just left. But he does all the hard work, and it seems he misses the glorious part. And it seems that Paul had struggled with his own call. Lord, let me stay somewhere just a little bit longer. And finally, he had to embrace the call that was on his life and quit fighting with the call. Happens today. Pastors get tired of looking at the same faces every week. And so they wish they could be a traveling evangelist. Oh, how wonderful it would be to see new faces every week. But if you talk to the traveling evangelist, he doesn't make enough money to live. And oh, how he wishes that he could be a pastor where he could settle down in one congregation with his family. Or how about prophets? who get so tired of people laughing at them because they're prophetic and they just wish they could be respected teachers. And teachers get so bored with themselves, they just wish they could be prophets. Oh, what a thrill it would be to preach by inspiration. We all have a tendency to wish that we were somebody else. And Paul says, I came to a place, Kata, where I finally have been dominated, I threw up the flag, I surrendered, and now I have been conquered by the grace of God, which is given unto me. I have a grace on my life. I can do in Moscow what other people have not been able to do. It's not because I'm so smart, it's because it is my grace. It's my grace. And God's grace has defined my place. And as long as I stay in that place, there is blessing on my life. And Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Now he's talking about himself as a what? Wise master builder. The word wise is the word sophos. It describes special insight not naturally attained. He says, as a wise master builder... Master builder is the Greek word architecton, and yes, it's where we get the word for a architect. So Paul says, here's my grace. My grace is I am like a specially enlightened architect. Well, what does an architect do? Probably have architects here today. Architects can see what no one else sees. They can look at a piece of land where there's nothing, and they can see a building there. Architects can draw the plans. They know how thick the foundation needs to be. Architects need to know how much plumbing, how much electricity. Architects can see it all. But if the architect himself tries to build the building, he'll fail. Why? Because he is not a builder. He is an architect. And here we see how every gift 
has to work with other gifts. The apostle needs the prophet and the teacher and the evangelist. It doesn't matter what your call is. If you don't connect with people who know how to do plumbing, if you don't connect with people who know how to do electricity, if you don't connect with people who know how to lay bricks, your vision will only remain a vision. You can't do anything without other God-called people who come along you. It takes a team. I'll use the example of our TV ministry, and I know that you have a TV ministry. Who's more important in the TV ministry? Me and Denise? Or the guys behind the cameras? Well, we'll find out real quick. If we have a mutiny with the TV operators, there won't be a TV ministry. If they walk out, there's not a TV ministry. So suddenly, this brings a kind of equality where every member is important. We may have the visible position, but their position is just as important as our position. It takes all of us working together. And Paul says, my part, I'm a planter. Now he changes the illustration. He says, I'm like an architect, a specially enlightened architect. I can see what needs to be done. I am the team leader. I can't build it. I've got to have people around me that are planters and waters and nourishers, but I can lead it. It's like years ago, Denise and I were, we weren't just poor, we were extremely poor. And something happened to the hot water tank in our house. Our house was 102 years old. This was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And we didn't have the money to hire a plumber. So I got a book on plumbing. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, I don't know why we did it in the middle of the night. Denise had a flashlight. And we walked down those old rickety stairs into the basement. And I took a wrench probably the first time I'd ever held a wrench in my life or since. And Denise, with the flashlight, read and pointed the flashlight while I started moving pipes. And suddenly I shouted because I knew I had fixed the hot water tank. But in some way, which I do not understand, I had connected the hot water tank to the toilet. <laughs> well, we didn't have any heat in our house. So guess what became our most favorite place in the house? You know, when it's cold and you go and sit a while, it's pretty refreshing. The problem is you flush the tank a few times and you're out of hot water. Well, I'm intelligent. I'm just not a plumber. I needed a plumber to do that. And in the same way, Paul says, I have the vision. I know what has to be built, but there's got to be people who come alongside of me who help me do this. And then he says, I laid the what? The what? Foundation. Everybody say foundation. Years ago when Denise and I built the big building in Riga, big church building. It was a faith project. <sighs> I'm doing a building in Moscow now. I said to the Lord, this is it. I'm not doing another building. I'm telling you, they take everything out of you. This building was so big, it was the size of a football field with three floors. And the land we bought was peat moss. You can't build on peat moss. So we had to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until finally we hit sand. And I would go out there every day and I would watch as hundreds of dump trucks would take the richest, blackest peat moss and would take it out and would take it to the river and dump it. I kept wondering how could we pack it up and send it to Walmart. It was such rich peat moss. And finally we had this giant hole and we ran out of money. 
Now I am the owner of the largest hole in the Republic of Latvia. And I would go out and walk through that hole. It was 12 feet deep, the size of a football field. And the devil would laugh at me. <laughs> you dug a big hole. Well, you're just like the man in the Bible who built a tower but didn't count the cost. I just hate it when the devil quotes scripture. I think, oh, yes, it's true, it's true. I'm just like the man in the Bible. I guess I didn't count the cost. Here I've got the biggest hole in Latvia. And it started snowing. And I was so thankful. Because I begin to tell people, of course, we can't do any more building this year because the snow has come. I was so thankful for the snow. And finally, by the next spring, we had collected more money. And when the snow was gone, they brought in sand. Then they brought in rock. Then they brought in sand. Then they brought in rock and sand and rock. And then rebarb all across the top of that. And then the cement trucks came. And I'd watch as those trucks would begin to move. And this was the first concrete pad that had ever been poured in Latvia. Everything had been built on stilts. No one had ever laid a concrete pad. They thought I was nuts. They had never heard of a concrete pad. So the concrete trucks came and truck after truck after truck after truck after truck and they would begin to pour that cement and finally the cement was poured and then these big grinders came out which began to grind the concrete to make it smooth and when we were finished, oh my gosh, we had a foundation. I loved that foundation. In fact, the day they were finished, I kissed it because we had put so much money into that foundation. I'd walk across it from one corner to the other corner and kind of angle it to see how big it was. But then it was time to build on top of my foundation. And little by little, my foundation began to disappear. My beautiful foundation, my Rick Renner, that was my foundation. I, that, that, was, that was my job. And now it's disappearing as walls go up and stage goes up. And the most tragic day was the day they laid the carpet. unrolled the carpet and my foundation completely disappeared. And finally it came time for the grand opening of our building and the U.S. ambassador came. This was the first church building to be built in 55 years in the city of Riga. The U.S. ambassador came, Kenneth and Gloria came, Marilyn Hickey came, Joyce Meyer came, everybody came. And there was a big, tall atrium right in the middle of the building. And when people would walk in that building, first thing they'd do is look up. As they walked across my foundation. Not one time did anybody ever say, amazing concrete. No one ever notices a foundation unless the foundation has a problem. Are you listening? And if you are a good foundation layer, it is likely that you will be forgotten because your work disappears under carpet. Do you understand what I'm saying? When we built that building, I said to Denise, I'm going to make sure that for centuries they know who built this building. <laughs> 
So I had a big slab of concrete sandblasted with our name in it as the pastors and the founders and the builders, and they put it right in the entryway. And now so many people have walked across it. It's no longer legible. You can't make out one letter in that granite. <laughs> but the foundation is still there. Do you understand? Well, Paul was a foundation layer. You've got to be very secure to be a foundation layer. He says, another man is building on top. Now think how twisted it would be if I had said, do not build this building. Do not cover my foundation. Just let it sit out here in this field for the next 200 years. I'm proud of my foundation. That's not the way that it's supposed to happen. It's natural for someone else to follow and build on top of the foundation. Paul says, it's fine, it's good, it's wonderful, but let every man take heed how he does it. And then he makes the statement, for no other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus, which is the equivalent of saying, don't mess with my foundation. My foundation is not flawed. Don't mess with it. And then the next sentence he says, now if any man build using, what does it say? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Are you guys still with me? I'm about to wrap this up. Now, why in the world would he use that phrase? If any man build using silver, gold, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, because in Rome and in all the big cities, if they wanted to build a building that would last for centuries and centuries and centuries, what would they build it out of? Stone. Stone survives the test of time. But there were more than 300,000 slaves in Rome who lived in little shacks that were composed of wood, hay, and stubble. Hay was on the roof. Stubble was on the floor. Even their furniture was stuffed with hay. It was a matchbox. It was not designed to pass the test of time. And so from time to time, one of those little shacks would catch on fire and the embers would float to the air, touch another one and another one and another one and another one, and finally the whole city would be in flames. Fires were a problem in the ancient world because of shacks made out of wood, hay, and stubble. And when the fires were finished, everything made out of wood, hay, and stubble was gone. Everything made out of stone, even if it was charred, it was still standing. And Paul says, the day will come when fire will try the quality of every man's work. Well, the day doesn't refer to some prophetic thing. It just refers to some day when fire starts in your life. You don't have to wait for some prophetic time chart. Just wait for life. Life will reveal what you have built. Fire will come. It may be self-ignited. You may start your own fire. You laughing? How many people do you think have started their own fires in their life? By stupid mistakes, moral mistakes, financial mistakes. They have started fires in their own life. And the fire reveals what have they built with their life. It reveals what did they put into the foundation of their marriage. It reveals what did they put into their kids? What did they put into the foundation of their business? Did they build haphazard or were they very careful in the way they built? Fire life will eventually reveal it in every man's life. Now, Denise and I have had a couple fires. Anybody here had any fires in your life? But here's the good news. If you burn the whole thing to the ground, the foundation is still there. So as long as your foundation was built right, you just push the rubbish out of the way and say, Jesus, here we go again. And you begin rebuilding your marriage and rebuilding your business and rebuilding your church.
as long as your foundation is right. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners.